Welcome to Grow, Cook, Eat, Arrange with me, Arthur Parkinson, and Sarah Raven. But for a change, we are totally live here with you on Facebook to do a lovely Q&A with you um, about gardens. And it's so nice to have the opportunity to talk to you all after you've been listening to me and Sarah Rabbit on for so many episodes. We've been so delighted with how many of you have downloaded and the comments we both get all the time. So I've come to see Sarah here in London and we are really looking forward to spending some time answering questions that we know you've got for us. We certainly are. So um, shall we kick off with one that was sent over the weekend? And then that gives you all time to send any that you want answering now. Um, so on, on the areas we know about, if possible, please. <laughs> but we can admit if we don't know it. Um, anyway, so the first question is how to decipher between a weed or a seed and plus help with weeds on clay soil, please. So mm. what would you say, how do you tell between a weed and a seed? And then I'll give you how I do. I would say anything you really love, I'd Google image now ah. or Instagram search. Okay, good idea. There's so much help now. Yeah. Um, but in general, I think it's, you know, the stuff that basically scatterguns everywhere, isn't it, really, as a rule? Yeah. If you see a thousand things in a flower bed that you've dug, you know, four weeks ago, uh, that's probably mostly weeds, but not always. So I would always say try and. But will they have first. it at really tiny seedling stage? Like, will yeah. they have a ground soil seedling? I don't know. No. Anyway, I do. Um, how I do it is a noughts and crosses grid or th it's sort of parallel lines. And I put my seed in direct sowing. And then anything that comes out in a line, I know is the seed. And anything in between, pretty yeah. much, I know is a weed. So that's how I've always done it. But. Um, yeah, that works okay. And then weeds on clay soil. Well, I'm on clay soil. Uh, our worst ones are bittercress, groundsel, um, uh, creeping buttercup, uh, bindweed. So with the mm. annuals like groundsel and bittercress, literally hoeing it off when they're at seedling stage if possible on ideally a dry day rather than a wet day because then the roots can reroot uh, if it's a wet day. And if it's perennial, you just got to dig them out. So if it's ground elder or cooch grass yeah. or bindweed, all of them tend to have roots that look like spaghetti. And I'm afraid that is just hard graft if you're organic, which we are. So um, in the old days, I might have said glyphosate, but I would never use that now. No. And do it on a wet day after it's rained so the ground is softer, I would say. Yeah, mm. good plan. So we've got another one come in. Do you want to read that? What are the best plants that you'd recommend for July until the dahlias start to flower? Um, so it's I'm guessing that's things that you would probably have to buy in now if you want fillers uh, for July. Um, yeah, Cosmos uh, is yeah. already in flower at Perch Hill. Uh, so that's Helen Gill. Um, hello, Helen. Um, so, yeah, I reckon hardy annuals, so really quick um, things we were talking about mm. today, actually, Cerinthi, uh, Linarias, the toad flaxes um, that you could just scatter in and they'll be in flower really quick. Uh, and then otherwise, try and get seedlings of something like a cosmos. Um, and particularly, I find the dwarfer ones like Sonata White or Sensation White is in flower really, really early. And that's already in full flower at home. So you can get plants practically in flower um, and, and online seedlings. Yeah. And you can always, I mean, in the garden centres, I was in a big garden centre yesterday, the main thing I was looking at were, were roses, to be honest. So if you've got, you know, yeah. if you're waiting for that daily foes to erupt, a hedge of roses, um, treat yourself to one a year. And before you know it, you'll have a completely perennial hedge around your dahlia bed. So there's another one that's just come in, Helena Curtis. Um, so she's struggling to grow zinnias in Staffordshire. She lives in Staffordshire. Oh. Any tips? Yes, we have lots of tips for <laughs> zinnias because we love them. And what I would say my tip would be never sow them too early. And so mm. now is a really perfect time. If you're happy, Helena, to have supper in your garden, then zinnias are happy to be in your garden. And I don't know about you, but mm, even last week it went cold at night and in Staffordshire probably colder. I reckon tonight, just about, we could have supper in the garden. So tonight or tomorrow is the time to sow your zinnias at, or plant out your zinnias. So either sow them in a gutter or in a module because they don't like root disturbance or just sow them direct mm. um, straight into the garden. So roughen up your soil, make sure it's kind of 
nice and got a fine texture and, and sew your packet of zinnias into mm. there. But they hate root disturbance, don't they? Mm -hmm. So sew them into those nice paper pots that you can get. Or I've treated myself actually to a seed tray that's made from recycled tyres. Mm. And it's okay. like nipples or udders of a cow <laughs> underneath. So you just press underneath each cell and out pops a little seedling once it's got its first pair of adult leaves and it can then be transplanted without disturbing it. So zinnias hate to be yeah. pricked out. Yeah. Um, they'll sulk if you do that. Um, when I worked at the Enveridgewater factory in Stoke, which isn't far away from Staffordshire, the one that did best was the Aztec Burgundy Bicolor. Yeah. So I'd really recommend that one. And that has a vase life of four weeks. Mm. Um, so we've got another one here from Sarah Connolly. Um, I'd love to know how you choose which colours to put together and are there any particular colours that naturally work? <laughs> Well, you start. Um, well, we've both got better, I think, with white. But yeah. I think the, the rule is keep white away on its own. Lovely with greys and you know, silvers, royal yeah. blues, silvers. Uh, but yeah, it's about our palettes, isn't it? Which you're the expert on, really. Well, yeah. So I think keep your palettes really quite restricted. So I would put the rich together mm. and perhaps a splash of boiled sweets. So the boiled sweets are literally if you went into an old fashioned sweet shop. So blackcurrant, lime, strawberry, orange, those sort of colours, a scattering of those through the dark and rich, which are sort of velvet Venetians. Anything based on white, I think, should be divided into the cools, which are blues and mauves, and cooler yellows and cooler pinks, and the warmer pastels, which are sort of apricot, peach, and cafe au lait, and keep them separate, and then they yeah. work every time. They're beautiful. Um, so, but, but don't do a jumble. And bizarrely, you know, really strong contrast isn't always a good idea. So I think black and white or deep crimson and white is too contrasty and not necessarily beautiful in a garden. And red, white and blue, weirdly, we all know we love the flag, but that is sort of, it's too noisy. It's too um, sort of, they, they, they outcompete with each other. You want something a bit more harmonious. More? What are you trialling at the moment that you're most excited for? Well, I am doing lots of different bishop dahlias. Um, mm. And I'm also trying to find beautiful roses that are single because I want to find out what are the nicest roses that are single and therefore beautiful but also good for bees. So I'm on the lookout for lots of things like that. And I'm growing zinnias again. I'm growing zinnias for a long time and doing lots of annual grasses as well, so lots of millets. I don't know what you're doing at Perchill, I've not been for a while. Um, well, inspired by you, we're doing a mint trial. We've got 16 oh, different mint varieties. We've got, on the edibles, actually, we've got figs in containers. Uh, so we've got seven different fig varieties. Um, on the ornamentals, we've got a big Rebecca trial. I'm really excited about that because some of them are already in flower and it's only mid to late June, and they've got amazing big flowers on quite short, stocky stems, which is, is going to mean that I think they're really good for cutting, and some of them are green, and I love green flowers. <laughs> um, and we always have a sweet pea trial, and we've got quite a few of this blue shift series where they open kind of purple, and then they turn blue, and they're looking quite exciting. So, yeah, lots of things. Oh, yeah, and finally, really excited about direct so mixes. So we've got oh, yeah, 14 different meadow mixes on trial mm. and some have hardly germinated and some are absolutely amazing so I'm going to write that up soon and um, so you'll get more info on that. Mm. Do you want to pick another one? Uh, Esther Lockwood Blake, are there any cut flower seeds that can still be sown for flowering late summer autumn? Yeah, tons, absolute tons, particularly the hardy annuals, uh, your beloved Cerinthi Major Yeah. Uh, and all the calendulas. Um, I have just sown some nasturtiums and I think if it's going to be an Indian autumn, they'll they'll soon be in flower. Yeah. Um, if you sowed them, you know, this week. Yeah, great, um, great, yeah. great. And yeah, antirhinums, so definitely. Snapdragons are perfect. Oh, we, the, we, there's one here about hens. Oh. Can, we, can we go back? Because So we'll come on to that. Um, so, yes, um, so definitely the snapdragons, the antirhinums, like Liberty Crimson or any of the Chantilly series, they'd be fantastic and they will flower almost till Christmas. Um, what other late sowing things? Oh, the amaranths are really yeah. happy. So again, just sow them direct and we use them. In fact, there's Very an sweet. amaranth behind me here and that's really fabulous for late. Um, yeah, loads of, and you know, and then the quick things like the calendulas, salvia viridis blue, all them and Cerinthia, as Arthur says. Yeah. So this is one for you, Arthur, oh, Afran, Zephyr. What are your favourite chicken breeds and why? Um, the ones I've got at the moment are for eggs, cream leg bars, beautiful, elegant, quite flighty, but they've really good layers and have lovely feathered hats. I've got four of those at the moment. I've also got Moran's, uh, given you mm. both those breeds over the years for 
The Moran's lay a lovely dark chocolate egg there, a bit heavier. And I've got lots of bantams. Uh, and I've just bought some silkies, some beautiful white silkies. Uh, oh, yes, very, with that amazing yeah. blue eye. I but saw your the, photo the of The poor that. things, they've come from someone who breeds them for show. And they're not used yeah. to being in a garden at all. They've not oh. come out of the hen house yet. <laughs> really? They're shy? <laughs> yeah, they're shy. Yeah. And then Chris Elwood, Jess, Jason or Jesson, um, my amaranths are struggling. Any tips? Well, do you know what? They are another thing that really likes um, being sown late, in my experience. Mm. And they are really slow to get going. And then suddenly at this time of year, they'll romp. So don't give up at all. I think they're one of the things that I would put into the, mo the May sewing list. I, I just, yeah. along with zinnias, I think they definitely prefer warmth um, rather than, uh, and long um, daylight hours to really get going and germinate. And they're actually coming up like mustard and cress in the garden. Yeah, now. I've direct sown mine actually. Okay. As soon as the dahlias started to peak up, I've just scattered them around. Um, so. Uh, good. So another one. Um, how can you stop ants? This is from Tricia Poxon, <laughs> taking over your pots and containers. Mint. Mint. It's mint, mint, mint. Oh. Um, I remember um, Chris uh, from Pennard Plants, the most incredibly good nursery. Uh, Chris Smith, he's called. Uh, he's a great guy on companion planting. And if you get ants um, like invading a propagator bed or invading pots, just go to your mint patch, hopefully you've got one, or go to your friends or neighbours and just rip up loads and loads of mint leaves and scatter them liberally. And the mint, the peppermint um, oil in them will last several days and that will really repel your ants. So give that a go. Let us know how it goes. But that is the most effective thing in my experience with an ant infestation. Amazing. I kind of rather love ants, so it's sort of difficult. But they are a pain when they yeah. when they get into containers. D ditch the ant powder and use the mint. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Leslie Rayner, how should you overwinter a dahlia planted in a container? Well, that's a good one. Yeah, really good one. Um, if you're going to lift them, I stop watering most of my dahlias around the end of October. So before we normally would get a hard frost. And so you lift them from the pot where they're quite dry. Take um, a good hard hand brush and brush off all the soil. Um, so you're not storing them with any soil on. You want the tubers to go into storage nice and clean. Don't wash them because moisture is what will kill them. So the whole idea is you're lifting them dry, just brushing off that soil and then put them into a box. I personally wrap them up in newspaper and then you want to put that box somewhere not damp, uh, but also not too hot. So to be honest, a spare room is ideal but mm. not a damp leaky shed and probably not the greenhouse either. Um, or if you're not planning to redo the pots they're growing in with bulbs and things, you could just move the whole pot into a garage or somewhere completely frost-free. Frost um, that's the other alternative. Yeah. And then we've got another one on dahlias here, actually. Uh, Steve Layton, can you explain why and what it means being told to pinch out the tips of the main dahlia shoot once three pairs of leaves have grown? Uh. Yes. If in doubt, pinch out. <laughs> and basically, with anything productive, whether it be a dahlia or a cosmos or a zinnia or an antirhinum, a snapdragon, um, what you want to do is remove apical dominance. And uh, the growth hormone in the plant will collect in the tip of the plant. And if you remove that tip, what happens is it forms a scar. And then because the apical dominance is gone, the auxiliary buds start to develop. And that's exactly so when you've got, let's say, a shoot with three pairs of leaves in the case of a dahlia, just pinch out the tip and it'll just immediately bush up. It'll not only produce auxiliary buds, but also more growth at the root. So you just get a bigger, chunkier plant. And what I always say when I'm teaching is what you want, if you want flower productive and, and really long performing plants, is you want rugby players not athletes. So athletes are tall, whippy, long distance runners, marathon runners. Uh -uh. What you want is stocky, chunky rugby players. And they're the good producers. And if in doubt, pinch out. That's what makes a rugby player. Definitely. Uh, Helen Moll, sweet pea tips, please. Mine all went brown and crusty and are not producing flowers. I would imagine, Helen, either they've become too dry mm. and they're not getting enough feed. So I find that sweet peas are the hungriest thing I grow in my garden. And so if there's space in the ground, I would always plant them in the ground rather than pots. And whether they're in pots or in the ground, I basically, where I'm planting them, dig out a huge amount of the soil and I replace that with the best rotted muck I can get hold of. 
and then mine have just started to flower. So this week they're being fed seaweed feed. Um, and I know you feed yours with comfrey. Yeah. Um, but seaweed and comfrey feed will really help with the mildew. And you can't really overfeed and you can't really overwater them if they're in the ground. Um, but feed them as much as possible. And as Sarah's just explained with the dahlias, they also love to be pinched out. That's what makes a lovely bushy sweet pea plant. But we've struggled. I mean, our sweet peas yeah. are later this year than ever before. They're just coming up to flower now, um, mm. mid-June, mid to late June. And it's because I think it was so dry in, in April, so dry and so cold, if you yeah. remember. I mean, we've had a really wet first two weeks of June. And now that's when they've come into flower. So Arthur's completely right. Water, 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 feed, feed, feed. And that's what will have made them. I think just the drought will have made them crunchy. So don't give up on sweet peas. They're genuinely not easy. Dig a big hole before you plant them, put lots of farm manure in and, and off they should go. And then there's one here from Catherine Claydon. What are the best salad greens to sow now? Well, this is a, a, a subject very dear to my heart. Um, and so as it, it's still pretty hot now, and so lettuce will bolt very, very quickly. So I wouldn't sow them now. I would wait until the beginning of August to sow your lettuce. But I would sow some of the salad leaves and um, the, the really drought tolerant or more drought. There are none that are very, but wild rocket, wild plant from Turkey. That is really good um, as a salad leaf for the summer hotter months. Summer purslane, similarly a wild plant of Turkey and Greece. And again, very, very uh, drought tolerant. And then also don't forget um, lots of the things like radish. They'll be fine so they can be sown and grown for your salad. Um, so, so, and then it's too dry for spinach, but you could do baby chard. That's pretty drought tolerant. So ironically, when we want to eat salads, which is June and July, perhaps not me, but um, it's actually one of the trickiest times to grow them because mm. um, if, they, if they sit hot and dry, they bolt. The other thing is to shade them. So at the moment, we've got our cucumbers growing up over a big frame, a, a lovely sort of bell dome. And um, the cucumbers are going up. And meanwhile, underneath, we've sown lots of salad. And the shade from the cucumber as it grows up will hopefully be enough to keep those salad leaves cool. So in the, we've put in the more drought tolerant things like um, red frills mustard and some lettuce in under the shade. But that's just starting to germinate now. Another one? Um, Jill Moore said, can I cut back my lupins hard back to fit Cosmos in? I would say you could. Yeah. Would you? Yeah, yeah. definitely. The perennials. Yeah. yeah. We mm. we um do with our lupins, we do like we do with our delphiniums. So after flowering, we cut them to the ground, leaf and all, mm. and they will re-sprout and often they will re-flower. Delphiniums and lupins, the perennials want the ones, the West Country lupins like terracotta, beef eater, etc. That's exactly what we've done. They're cut to the ground now and up they will come again. You can slot other things, but also you'll get a second flowering. Great. Do you pinch out zinnias? So this is from Dawn Norburn. Yes, mm. you do. If in doubt, pinch out. <laughs> really critical. Again, otherwise you get a tall spindly thing that forms a flower. And quite often it then thinks, well, I've made my babies, so I'm going to die now. And it, it really doesn't do very much. So if in doubt, pinch out. And with a zinnia, I would do it at the three leaf stage. So you get a pair of seed leaves and then you've got one, two, three leaves and you pinch out the tip. And you'll see immediately, and water, and you'll see immediately, but water in the morning, not at night. Um, it will, it, within a week, you'll see it bushing out and, mm. and really going for it. But yeah. so, yeah, definitely pinch out. To, to demonstrate, I'm just going to lift up my arms. Imagine I, this, my head's the grove tip and Sarah's sliced off my head. So basically yeah. you're doing that. Yeah. So you're just taking out the tip in between the, the last pair of leaves. Yeah. Uh, another one from Fiona Hanley. If you don't have a greenhouse, when's a good time to plant out dahlia tubers? Yes, yeah, it's, it's what I did this year. I didn't plant any of my dahlia tubers inside. I just delayed planting them at all until about the end of April. First week of May, I was massively planting out my dahlia tubers. And if it had been a spring where we were getting hard frosts, I would have just covered over the pots with hessian blankets like old potato sacks to keep the frost off the, the pot, re, freshly potted tubers. Uh, the key thing I find is not don't water them too much when you just plant them. If the compost is moist to the touch, just give each a sprinkle. And then when they start to shoot, then start to increase watering and check the pots every single day for slugs because they love to hide underneath. Yeah. And then what happens at night is they come out from underneath 
and they treat your little daily tips that you've been excited over all day like caviar and you come out in the morning and you're really upset. So they are a bit of um, a task to get going, but once they're growing, they're fine and always plant them into at least a two litre pot. They, they want space to root down and feel cool. Don't, don't skimp on the size of pot that you're planting them up into. And, and we've got another question here from another Sarah, uh, but spelt without the H, unlike me. I've just moved and have got a big empty space. What would be your can't be without flowers for cutting? Dahlias. <laughs> dahlias, dahlias, dahlias. And you can still get a decent sized plant uh, online from nurseries, including ours, but um, which is already potted, already growing, will be in flower in three to four weeks. And that will keep you in cut flowers for all the way through until November. And of course they're perennial and um, they're just incredible value. You can just pick, 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 and and then either mulch them, or if you're in a really cold spot, dig them up and store them inside. But I leave them in, in the ground. And then also I would definitely get some Cosmos seedlings. And there are so many, there are 30 varieties in our seed range um, for next spring. It's just, there's been such a blossoming mm. of the whole Cosmos clan. Um, and there are sort of ones called cupcakes that look literally like a sort of um, a, a, a cupcake case. Um, <laughs> and it, and it's, they're just amazing. And then there are other ones that are sort of partly double colorette like a day. Anyway, the, uh, the world's your oyster as far as both dailies and cosmos. And the reason that I say, particularly because Sarah says she's got lots of space, dailies need lots of space, 75 centimeter spacings, cosmos 45 centimeter spacing so um you know a good 18 inches apart and they will just flower their socks off for ages so they're really really good value lovely oh there's a good one for you arthur hannah russell oh sunflower hannah russell sunflower what is the ideal time to plant out well i've got lots of sunflowers because i sow them late deliberately because they're going to fill the gap all, all my beds are full of foxgloves at the moment they're just starting to fade and i've got lots of sunflower claret in nine centimeter pots and so they will probably be planted out towards the end of this month, to be honest, but lots of milk and of course, full sun. And um, I probably will have to guard them a little bit against the slugs. So I'll probably dress around each freshly planted seedling to have a moat of sharp grit, gritty sand, uh, just so the slugs don't dine on them overnight. Lovely. Um, and then a Gillian Miles, my delphiniums have loads of leaf, but no flowers. What have I done wrong? Oh. Well, I would say maybe, it, is it too early? How old are they? So two-year-old plants uh, would, should start flowering. Are they too shady? Delphiniums are real sunbakers. They really love. And even in a border, if they're too overshadowed by things, even if it's quite a sunny border, they won't flower so well. But um, if you get those two things right, they, they really should flower. So bear with them, be a little bit patient and possibly move them into a sunny situation we've just moved our delphiniums actually they're really easy and don't mind being moved at all mm -hmm. um and and just uh, we've put them in a sunnier place and they're flowering away like bilio yeah alice if you have a plant that started to make flowers before bushing up properly should you cut the flowers to encourage foliage growth i think we both say yes, yes. and if it's something like a cosmos often you buy them and there's a flower on if you just cut that for the vase that's basically pinching out the same thing and it will help to create more flower. Whenever I get a six pack of violas or pansies, particularly in the autumn, I always cut the big flowers that they have in the garden centre off for the vase and it makes them bush up really nicely. So don't be afraid of taking the flower off any annuals. It will help them to be more vigorous. And then uh, Janine has asked about Bupleurum. Is it cut and come again? Well, not as much as other annuals. <laughs> I love it. It's it's one of the great things to replace euphorbias because it doesn't have the sap, but it's got that lovely acid green colouring, but it's not prolifically cut and come again. Mm. If you cut very carefully above a lateral pair of leaves, it may bush out a bit, but like Ami Magus, it, 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 it's not very prolific. So you need quite a lot to produce. You know, it's not like a cosmos that will just produce more and more and more flower. So um, yeah, it, it, it's one of the least... Uh, prolific of the of the annuals mm. and then there's a good one from Deborah here recommendations for best daily for wedding or bouquet displays please oh dreamy question for us both isn't yeah, it? yeah. Um, <laughs> um depends whether yeah. you want white doesn't it yes but we all love a cafe au lait to be honest we do yeah. yeah um so cafe au lait probably but on a hot day it would be a nightmare wouldn't it 
Yes, to be honest. it would. It would. Um, it would. Probably Swan Lake would be nicer for a white wedding, I'd say. Yeah, a bit more, it's a good one. Yeah, yeah. less deaverish. Um, Siberia is a good one for cutting. Mm. Has has quite a good vase life. So those are good whites. I love if you want a bit of muted sort of pastely colours. Really good vase life is um, Molly Raven, named yes, after my beautiful. daughter. Um, and that goes very well with Café Olé if you want a little bit of sort of more muted colour in there. A very, very good vase life. And um, the other one that actually has a really good vase life, which we've bred also, is called Perch Hill, mm. which is more in the sort of, I think of it like a Negroni colour. It's like Campari with orange juice it, or sort of Calamine lotion, you know, that kind of rather nice uh, smoky pink. Um, that, that's got a really good vase life. So there are lots, but I would say the classic is three cafe au lait um, heads with a bit of nigella and perhaps some cosmos, mm. and you've you've got a wedding bouquet. I mean, it, it, you know, they are really fantastic. And for buttonholes, I think new baby is fantastic. Nice oh, little ball yes, daily. Isn't that I mean, it beautiful? is orange, but against black or navy blue on a suit, I think that looks pretty pretty damn good with a bit of panic and frost explosion. So uh, that hopefully won't flop within half an hour. Um, and then um, Alison has asked, um, good grass that doesn't get out of control. Well, certainly my favourite mm. is Steeper Gigantia. Um, and so it, it forms these really quite elegant tussocks, almost like you might get marron grass on the beach or whatever, but it's not invasive. And then you get these wonderful tall, I mean, two metre tall, um, great wands, golden wands um, of, of grassy heads which aren't chunky, they're really airy and ethereal and beautiful. And they come out in May, June, and they only get blasted um, apart by the wind and rain in November. Mm. So yeah. that would be my number one favourite. Oh, I know another well, one you love. you're going to have to pronounce it because we're Ca alive. I forgot, because <laughs> it's not Camassia, is it? It's no. Camassium. Ca Casmanthium. Casmanthium <laughs> latifolium. We both love. <laughs> And it's easy to grow from seed. And yeah. do you want to give the tip for the for the seed yeah, sowing? It some takes people struggle. a long time to, to germinate. Give it at least six weeks and it likes changes in temperature. So if you start it off on your windowsill, move it outside for a few days, then move it back in. Same again in a greenhouse. Have it in the greenhouse for a hot day, then move it somewhere shady. And it will eventually germinate. We promise you it's just a very slow to get going seed, but it's wonderful. I love it even in its first year before you get the seed head. It looks like a lovely lush clump of bamboo. Very mm. drought tolerant. Someone asked um, earlier, what's a good grass for a pot? That would be my mm. number one for a pot, actually. Wonderful. Uh, it doesn't get too tall. So upstanding mm. and and sort of, it just, yeah, it's a bit. And then it has these seed wonderful heads. flower and then seed heads that look like um, a, a, a sort of, sheath of wheat that's been run over mm. <laughs> and so it's flat and and it's so elegant um yeah it, it's a beautiful thing so that's casmanthium c-h-a-s-m-i-t-h-i-u-m wonderful thing lots of fantastic questions coming in here um so i have a lot of black spot on my roses is it it's the same every year how do i treat it Dinner. <laughs> salvia, 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 uh, salvia, salvia. The smaller leaf ones that are the best ones I find. Um, so Genemsis, and there's so many different ones. I've got cherry pie in my garden this year. Um, that's beautiful. And you smell them when you're watering when it's a, a warm evening. The smell of pepper. I mean, you discovered this. If any of you are planning to visit Perch Hill. Uh, this year or have already visited you'll have seen the rose garden all the rose beds you can't see an inch of soil all the roses are just underneath these clouds of these gorgeous salvias uh, and the salvias really do take the rose garden into another dimension so can't recommend them more highly yeah absolutely um yeah salvia salvia salvias the small ones don't not something like salvia amistad because no. it's actually too big for the rose and we'll compete with it and we found they do struggle a bit with mm. the bigger ones so it's got to be the ones that you can tuck in under the skirts and um, they give off sulfur when they get warm as Arthur said and that's a natural fungicide so those are those are ideal so then Elizabeth can you deadhead gems to keep them flowering Mm. Helps a little bit. Helps a little bit. Uh, but I think eventually, once the foliage does good tatty, I think you'd take the shears to the lot, wouldn't you? Just yeah. to get the, the fresh foliage. And you might get a few, but you're not going to get a, a really good flush like the first one that you got. Yeah. yeah. I mean, GMs are so great for the May-June colour gap. Mm. And uh, we have them and, and they overlap with our perennialised tulip ballerina. Um, and up comes um, Jim, Totally Tangerine, and there's a lovely one called Pink Petticoats, and they're so pretty all the way through May. 
But by now, in fact, walking around looking at the roses at the weekend, I was thinking, oh, the gyms, yeah, they're, they're, they're on their way out now. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think at that point, it's kind of like cut them back as Arthur, or deadhead them to start with. But I doubt you'll get more, to be honest, with gyms. I think they really are early summer performers. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so here's another one from oh, yeah. Sandra. Sandra. Any recommendations for keeping things going between Allium and Dahlia time? I would say sweet peas are fantastic, actually, for that. Yeah. Um, literally, in my garden, all my pots are brimming with dahlias, but they're just getting their buds, whereas all the pots and the bits of beds that I've got sweet peas in, they're just like walls of colour and perfume. So sweet pea machicana, I think, is my favourite one. Yeah. Your, your favourite. You yeah, just can't beat it for scent. Smell. Yeah. Um, I've done, done lots this year, but that's the one where on a hot day in my bedroom, it just smells of honey. So so that uh, this autumn uh, for next year to fill the, fill the gap. Yeah. And, and, and any of the hardy annuals. So, mm. uh, you know, we already mentioned them earlier, but Salvia viridis blue, the blue clary, Cerinthi is, is really performing in the garden well now. The calendulas, if you like strong colours, Indian prints, if you like pale colours, sunset buff. Yeah. Um, you know, any any of those hardy annuals. And the thing that's looking really wonderful now in the garden is Ami. But a lot of these, to flower really strongly now, they need to be sown in September. Mm. So they need to be sown in the autumn. So we've got Ami now standing at nearly 10 foot tall. It's incredible. But those were sown last September. So it's really worth doing that um, and then and then getting them out. Yeah. Jason, what's a good way to keep cuttings over winter to plant out the following year? Are pots or modules better? I would say, Jason, things like uh, Pelagonium atta of roses that you could take cuttings of, um, cold frame, frost free, but I would keep them on the dry side rather than wet. Yeah. Uh, I think quite often with a lot of cuttings, they've only just started to put yeah. their roots down. And if they're wet over winter, the wet plus the cold, just like a daily tuber, if it's too wet and too cold, that combined will just cause them to rot. And a lot of the cuttings that we love, the salvias, the pelagoniums, yeah. they are Mediterranean origin type plants. They prefer to be like, be dry. So a cold frame somewhere in the garden, ideally somewhere where it will catch at least the winter sun and keep them on the dry side and preen them constantly. You know, any dead leaves that will help to keep them nice and free from any fungus that might affect them. But and I would definitely say if you're overwintering cuttings, mm. quite good size pots. So yeah. um, if they've rooted through, I would pot them into their own individual, either one or even two litre pot, if you've got the space that is, um, and and let them root down into that. And then if they're hardy, plant them out in April, next April. Um, if they're half hardy, wait until, um, you know, like salvias and pelagonians, wait until May. Mm -hmm. And then Richards asked us, what do you do with your old tulip bulbs in pots when they finish? Well, Arthur will tell you what he does. Well, I've, I've started to put them at the side of the road with a, a nice cardboard sign saying, please take and plant in, in your garden uh, with the foliage still on. And people do take them. But to be honest, the bulbs that have looked gorgeous this year, they just get so hot in their pots. By the time you take them out, they've made baby bulbs. So I do buy fresh tulip bulbs every year for my pots. But if you've got space plant them in the beds, mm. snap the seed heads off so all the energy goes back into the original bulb and plant them in the ground, bit of grit underneath them. They will flower, but it might take a few years for them to reflower really well because they've spent all their energy making babies. Yeah, and also it's down to variety. Yeah. So if you've um, gone for a, a perennial uh, family in the tulip group. So like the Viridifloras are very mm. perennial. Um, so are the Darwin hybrids, but a lot of us don't like them so much because they're quite chunky. The species tulips, all those, if they've been in a pot, definitely take them out, keep them cool until the following autumn. I mean, you know, August, September, October time, and then plant them again. And I, that's when I use the ones that have been in pots in the cutting garden. Mm. And I plant them deeply. And the reason that I plant them deeply at that point is that one, the grey squirrels can't dig them up if they're honestly down to six inches in the cutting garden. Two, they're likely they're unlikely to get hot again as they would have done in a pot, and so they don't make bulbils, so they they are more perennial. And three, you don't end up when you're digging seedlings over the top with a trowel digging them up. So um, I often take them out of a pot when they've still got leaf on and actually plant them straight out. I don't even bother to dry them off. Mm. More? Helen, do you cut foliage on dahlias? I'm guessing you mean, do you cut the foliage for the vase? We'd always go down to a pair of leaves and that's where we'd cut. So that means that auxiliary bud formation will form 
and that means you're going to get more flowers. And then when we take them into the house, to be honest, we would strip, I think, most of the foliage off, yeah. wouldn't we? Yeah. Uh, so no foliage under the waterline. To be honest, I find a lot of the decorative daily foliage, it's like big cabbage leaves, so I strip yeah. that. The bishops is a bit nicer. Um, but yeah, as a rule, foliage isn't your friend when it comes to having the dahlias in the vows. They last longer without, without actually. It, yeah. yeah, so some of them, you know, if it's quite elegant, it might you might want to keep some. There's a there's a really good question here from Sarah Connolly, who's um, she, we've already answered one of hers actually, but mm. we'll we'll do another, which is about bells of Ireland and really mm. tricky to germinate. Now this was answered um, in fact by my husband about ten years ago. Um, he went to Greenland or Iceland, one of those cold places, <laughs> and um, and he sent me a photo of two things that I've always found it difficult to germinate. One was a whole field of bells of Ireland or Molicella levis, and the second was a whole field of larkspur. And both those self-seed after they've had a really cold winter and that breaks their dormancy. So um, I now put both of those seed in a freezer for two weeks before I sow it. And they also then like really quite cold nights, hot days, cold nights, hot days. And that also uh, breaks their dormancy. So they are a fiddle, but I mean, they're such a beautiful plant, particularly both of them if they're well staked. Um, and they are things that if you can get seedlings, because germinating them commercially in a commercial setup with the right temperature controls is kind of easier. But, you know, I still love them and carefully staked with a double layer of jute netting over Molicella levis and Larkspur. I know you didn't ask about Larkspur, but I think of them always as twins because they're both wildflowers from the same situation and they need the same situation to germinate them. Mm. Catherine, can poppies work in a perennial meadow? Um, I understand this question because we're seeing poppies a lot in these meadows. I think people get confused. A lot of the poppies that you see are part of annual mixes. So the corn cornfield poppies um, will be an annual mix. And same with the opium poppies. They both need disturbed soil and they're annuals, so they'll flower in the same year. But if you're thinking, if you've got a sunny meadow, uh, when I lived in Stoke-on-Trent, I used to see oriental poppies popping up on wasteland grass. Um, yeah. So there's one called Goliath, and I think yeah. that would cope really well in a, in a grassland setting. So um, you could plant that this year. Um, you probably find it in the garden centre discounted now because they've finished flowering. So just pop that in the grass. And as long as it's on gritty soil, full sun, that should do very well in grass as a perennial. Uh, there's there's a funny question here, which I think you and I have to answer, Arthur, and I'll answer on your behalf. <laughs> Number from Kim. Sarah, yeah. if I was a plant, <clears throat> what plant would I be and why? So I can say I think you would be something like Rosa Mutabilis, a really e e ethereal, beautiful, wafty, yeah. wispy, skinny... <laughs> Um, <laughs> a scented, fragrant, good for pollinators rose. So you'd be Rosa Mutabilis. What would I be? Oh, that's so flattering. A big you. fat dahlia. No, I think you would be. <laughs> I think you would be. Um, I think you'd be Alstroemeria Indian Summer, actually. Oh, do you? Because you're so giving. And the more you pull, them, you Aww. come up again, no matter what hits you. Oh, you've, um, you've, you've touched yeah. us now, Kim. That's a sweet question. <laughs> and I love Alstroemeria Indian Summer. It's a beautiful perennial. In fact, it works very well in a pot. Um, yes, but as I it's say, not too big. If, if Sarah was at Alstomir, you would have to pull her flower because that would activate another wonderful flower to, to come within weeks. So it pull would. your Alstomir. Like yeah, like rhubarb, it's true. <laughs> and then Mike or Mike, um, uh, that might be a spelling mistake, I don't know. Anyway, can you sow Cosmos now? Absolutely yes, yeah. you really can. It will germinate overnight if not in a couple of days uh, particularly with a bit of basil heat and you can easily do that or you could just put it on a window ledge germinate so so quickly mm. um i i would probably still i would probably still sow it inside rather than direct sow it because it just speeds up and and then plant it out once it's got two pairs of leaves and honestly that would be in two weeks time it'll romp and that will be in flower in eight weeks time probably so definitely worth it uh, you know your august september october and even into November, because you'll have a young plant. And so then, depending where you are in the country, of course, but in Perch Hill, if I sow Cosmos in June, I'm still picking them into November. So definitely, definitely worth it. Mm. Uh, Ruth, have you noticed lots of plants not growing as vigorously this year? My Cosmos and Larkspur are much shorter than usual. Um, I have a little bit. Drought yeah. and cold nights. Drought and um, cold nights. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, you're probably not the only one, Ruth. So don't worry, things will catch up, I'm sure. It's warm today, so... And this, um, the, the wet that we had the last two weeks, um, I mean, I know it, it was lovely last week, but the two mm. weeks before that, oh, gosh, it was wet. And I know it was because um, we were trying to garden at Perch Hill and the gardeners would, would come in and their faces were 
covered in mud and I'm really sorry I wasn't out there all the time or hardly at all actually if I'm honest uh, at that point because I was doing other things but uh, it was muddy and wet and that has spurred things on and now we're finding things are growing much better and more back to normal but you're right you know it, it, things have been really stunted and, and we found the tulips this spring were mm. much shorter than normal and it's again rain that, in April, wasn't that's it? drought yeah yeah, yeah. Um, somebody asked uh, about loop aphids and lupins. I know you've oh, had yeah. terrible trouble this year with lupin aphid. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm really happy to talk about. It. So, um, it, always if you get a pest on a plant that is quite persistent, but you really love the plant and you don't want to stop growing it, it's learning its life cycle. And Josie, our head gardener, who is quite sort of nerdy sciencey, which is incredibly helpful, um, looked up aphids and lupin aphids particularly, and they overwinter in the crown of the plant. Mm. So they're sort of right down in the ground. You wouldn't even notice them, but they come up already infected. And because it was such a mild winter that we had, um, it, none they of them were, were killed. And even if you've just got one in a row or a clump, we've got a big row of terracotta, beef eater and masterpiece and it just cross transferred from one to another. But, but don't give up. So what we did, and it's what I really, really believe in, is rather than trying to treat it, obviously we wouldn't use a chemical, but some people told us 50% milk, 50% water was really good for aphid treatment. And I'm sure you all know that washing up liquid is, is famously good because it breaks the skin by osmosis mm -hmm. of the aphids. But anyway, what we did, was we brought all the bird feeders into the lupin bed <clears throat> and encouraged the birds to realise that was a good place to feed. And when it, I was quiet there over the Jubilee and the gardeners weren't there, I took a table and a chair out and I sat with a camera and I watched the lupins and the fledgling blue tits came out of the hedge oh. and were just feasting on the aphids, on the lupins, and they're now completely clear. And wow. not just that, but the blackbirds were um, running along underneath the fledgling blue tits and eating all the ones that they discarded underneath. So it was like it, the the whole the whole balance was being re rebalanced, if you see what I mean. So that was I, I mean I love that because it's just like using friendly um, nature to help you with nature you don't want quite so much. Mm. Uh, Jessica's asked a nice one for you. Well, both of us actually. Favorite veg to plant as ornamentals, edibles, along with flowers. Um, I would say I can't wait to have a big garden where I'm going to have a big bed of rhubarb. Um, yes. I think it's so reminiscent of Beatrix Potter. And I love your rhubarb patch because it's a big bed, but you've always got the most beautiful tulips uh, coming up through it all. Um, I love kale red ball too. Yeah, uh, kale red ball is so, a, a big um, yeah. thing, a thing of Arthur's. And Arthur's taught me that just because kale red ball at full size will get to a metre and a half, it doesn't matter. You can still put it in a pot and yeah. you can bonsai it. So you just keep picking it and eating it, or you can just pick it um, <laughs> and feed it to the hens like Arthur does. Um, but you just keep bonsai it and it keeps branching and branching and branching. So you get a stunted but bushy, almost like a crimson shrub, totally yeah. evergreen all the way through the winter. So I think kale red ball is a really beautiful edible ornamental. I think globe artichokes are mm, absolutely fabulous. Stunning. And um, so I would put the rhubarb in the shade and the globe artichokes in the sun and put tulips all the way through them, particularly perennial varieties like the Verida floras. Mm. And then you've got an edible and ornamental combination, which yeah. works really well. Artichokes, fantastic for pots as well. Yeah, Beautiful. wonderful. Yeah. But they need to be old. Yeah. Uh, I mean, not old, but, you know, one-year-old seedlings don't really cut the mustard, no. even two-year-old. So we lift ours and store them, and we've now got three-year-old plants, and they're fabulous mm. this year. Mm. So be patient with them, I'd yeah. say. Uh, so then um, Janine has asked, can you still sow Ami now? <clears throat> Do you know what? I would wait now um, and I would wait until September and that will be for next year. I mean, of course you can and you will have, you know, a really lovely flowers probably in the autumn. But what I would say with Ami is it's, it's part of the carrot family and it has a deep taproot. And as we're in the hot, dry period, that taproot doesn't establish so well. And so you get rather wimpy um, plants of it. You know, whereas if you sow it in the autumn, just like a broad bean, it's got time in the cool and wet to get its massive taproot down. And then you get this huge performance. So you can sow it, but you just won't get something so substantial. Mm. It'll be more like three foot rather than six, ten foot um, from an autumn sowing. Mm. 
Sarah's asking, I have roses in pots. I think they need a better feed or should we grow them in bigger pots? I don't have any soil to grow them in. Um, I would say that roses, a bit like sweet peas when it comes to having them in pots, like a deeper pot rather than a shallow pot. I've got roses um, in an old cattle trough. Uh, I thought that would be absolutely resplendent. The salvias, I've loved it, but the roses, I think because their roots get too hot in full summer, they haven't done brilliantly well. But I think anything that's dolly tub, you know, so hip, foot to hip size in, in height and quite girthy, uh, that's a good pot for a rose and fill it with as much good farmyard organic manure as you can. Mix it in with a good uh, loamy John Innes, um, so mature plant compost, and that will be a good potting up medium. And if you can, any molehill soil to mix in, they'll love that. Um, and bizarrely, my aunt has lots of roses in pots. And what she does, she's got like a, a big wadge of real solid clay in water. And she chucks it over her roses whenever it's hot. And she's got this fairy wow. that they love hard clay. And her roses do look beautiful, but I have told her to underplant them in this pot with salvia. Uh, someone asked what was the best salvia for in a pot. I think it's Natch Linda Genemsis. Yeah. I would say it's beautiful purple, yeah. very fine leaf. And as we've said, it gives off that pepper aromatic scent and that helps with black spot. Um, but water your roses. And do you know, there's a new one. You know mm. Cherry Lips, which yeah. I'm not so keen on, which is red and white. But there's a new one called, I think it's called Amethyst, Amethyst Lips. Lips. Yeah, and it is nice. And it, it flowers even longer than Nathlinda in, really? in, in, in the trial. Yeah, it's yeah. done really well. Um, so, I mean, we're going to begin to wind up, but maybe three or four more questions. And yeah. so um, Charlotte has got a really interesting question here. I've struggled with my peat-free compost for sowing seeds. Yeah. Any tips? We all so have, have we. <laughs> Blimey, so have we. And we have a theory um, which is based in, in some rationale. It's not just plucked from the ether, which is that there is a real problem with a chemical called amylopyrrolid mm. in peat-free compost because what's happening with peat-free compost is um, a lot of the manufacturers, the makers of it, are relying on farmyard manure to up the um, water retention and the sort of oomph in it, uh, which, of course, is what you get from peat. So when you take out the peat, you put in more farmyard manure. Now, the problem with that is that aminopyrrolid is a chemical that's used against broadleaf weeds in a pasture because it kills ragwort as well as docks and thistles. And it has a very long half-life. And so what's happening is aminopyrrolid is going onto our fields to kill the perennial weeds, but then it goes through the gastrointestinal tract of a horse or a cow and it's pooed out and it's still active for three years. And that is creeping its way into quite a lot of our compost. Well, that's what we think, because like you, we've had real problems. Probably this is the fourth year we've had problems. Not as bad as last year, the year before and the year before that. And it's really frustrating because we get these wonderful things to trial and we put them in our pots mm -hmm. and they just falter. They just haven't done well. So you are not alone and there is no easy answer. The only thing to do is to do a broad bean test on your compost. And that's literally to sow some broad bean seeds. And if they come up nice and quick, which they do, they should germinate in about five days at this time of year. But they should come straight and silvery green. If they're a bit sort of twisted and they've got some hint of black, that is probably immunoparallel contamination. So do a quick test on whatever you decide to buy. And then you'll be able to see whether hopefully your peat-free compost is amino pyrrolid free. Very good. Uh, Jure, any tips for dealing with slugs, please? Um, <laughs> sorry, we are live. Um, sneezed. Um, you're the best one for this, aren't you, in terms of encouraging the birds? I think the fact that you've planted lots of hedges, that means you've got blackbirds and thrushes there in the garden all the time. Um, plant a hedge if yeah, you can. Not all of us can plant a no. hedge, but if you've got um, the space, plant a hedge. Yeah. And um, what I would say to anyone who's keen on sowing seeds like I am is get them up off the floor. Uh, so yeah. a garden table that's just devoted to your seeds somewhere in full sun if you can. So you've got everything up off the floor. Make it harder for them basically to get to your precious things. Um, so, you know, a nice old cast iron table or even, you know, crates. If you've got nothing at all, get them up off the floor. And I found that seaweed um, protection has worked really well. That's saved my hostas and saved yeah. all my dahlias this year. Yeah. Um, and and just physical barriers. So mm. like Arthur's really keen on like oyster shells, which we give yeah. to the hens. But also we put that it's called shell on earth and we put that round our beans, for instance, quite, quite thickly. And that really helps. But I'm a great believer in, in upping the bird population. 
And I know that isn't instant. That won't work this year, but it will start no. working next year. Mm. So maybe we'll just do two more questions. So if, if you pick one and I'll yeah. pick one and then we'll round up. Uh, Jason's asked us a nice one. What are some underrated plants you think more people should be growing in their gardens in general? Very uh, good. Yeah, really nice I love one. that. Dutch iris. I mean, for me, mm. no one grows or very, very few people grow those florist iris. Not the great flamboyant bearded iris, which are fabulous, but they're very fashionable. But the things that aren't fashionable at the moment are Dutch iris. And why I love them is that they come in a wonderful array of colours, like red embers is the colour of mahogany. It's the most beautiful thing. And there's another one called, um, I think it's called Lion King, that's sort of bronzy. Anyway, they flower just as the tulips go over and before basically most of the roses and sweet peas start. So they flower from the middle of May to the middle of June. And you can pick them to heart's content and they are completely perennial. So I put a trial in in our cutting garden 15 years ago and they come back bigger and better every year and they plug that May gap. So I don't understand why more people don't grow them. Mm. What's yours? Um, I think in terms of trees, I think crab apples are really yeah. underused, actually. Yeah. You get the blossom in the spring, fantastic varieties, perfect for small gardens. Um, and then as well as the blossom, you get wonderful, some some have crimson leaves, so I love Wisley. Uh, there's one called Laura that's beautiful. Um, so you get the blossom for bees and then they start to fruit. And it's like a huge bird feeder in the garden. Uh, so you get loads of lovely birds and so lovely to have blossom and fruit and small tree. And I also think cornice... Um, all the cornices are really underused for winter colour. So um, last one, I think, uh, probably if that's all right, but it seems to have been popular, so I'm sure we'll do it again. Yeah. Um, so there's one from Matthew, which I think is the most lovely, lovely question to finish on. Recommended plants to create a shady, dappled white garden to reflect the moonlight. Well, I last week was a very lucky person, which is on the full moon day, which was the 14th of June. I was in the white garden at Sissinghurst. Mm. And it was just spectacularly, wonderfully romantic and one of the most beautiful things that one could possibly do. And um, of course, there are as many um, white plants really that thrive in shade as thrive in sun. The white foxglove is absolutely happy mm. in dappled shade. We have it against a north facing hedge. Nicotianas, so Nicotiana sylvestris and Nicotiana grandiflora, incredible scent, very, very happy in shade. The Japanese anemones, very happy in shade. And there's a white acanthus called Acanthus ruledin, which doesn't get mildew, it's not invasive, and it thrives in shade. So hopefully there are a few ideas there. And oh, and of course, white Hesperus matronalis. So, so your foxgloves and your white Hesperus matronalis now, sweet rocket, perfumed, happy in dappled shade. So lots of ideas. And of course, a white garden in the evening is, is just a wonderful, wonderful thing. So beautiful. I think we've done well. I think we've, we've, we've asked, answered. I hope we've answered lots. We thought we were going to answer 15 questions. I think we must have done more like 50 <laughs> or flattered. 60. So A bit manic. Ah. <laughs> but um, anyway, thanks very much for joining us, everybody. And we'll try yeah. and do another live again quite soon. Mm. And thank you for making Grow Cookie to Range such a wonderful success. It's really lovely being able to broadcast all our knowledge and chattering away to each other every week to you. So thank you for listening to us. And have a lovely rest of evening. Bye. Bye.